All right, greetings one and all, and welcome to this math lesson. In this math lesson, we will be going over BGCSE, this BGCSE Maths Paper 1. And we'll be looking at the questions as, as well as the answers, working out the problems together. All right, so let's begin. So this is the front cover of the BGCSE um, Mathematics Paper 1. Um, this is the 2008 year for this particular paper. All right, let's go. The first question says, write down the next number in each sequence. So if you look carefully, um, how do we move from two to six? Well, how to move from two to six, you add four, all right? And so the next question is, how do we move from six to 10? Well, to move from six to 10, you add four as well. And so that means that in order to get our missing number that's in the sequence, what we have to do is we have to add four. And so 10 plus four, is definitely 14. So the missing number here is going to be 14. Why? Because if we do 10 plus four, that's gonna be 14. So the correct answer for this one is definitely 14. Move right along. Here we have the sequence 19, 16, and 13. And if you notice carefully, in order, from, in order for us to move from 19 to 16, we don't add, but we subtract. In fact, we subtract three. So 19 minus three is 16. And again, we subtract three again. So it's 16 minus three. And 16 minus three is 13. And so we're gonna subtract again to get our missing number. So we subtract three and 13 minus three is definitely 10. So in order to get our missing number for this, we minus 13 and three. So 13 minus three is definitely 10. So that's how we're gonna get our missing number. Both of these are called arithmetic sequences. And so we are going to look at question number two. So the first answer was 14, the second answer is 10. All right, so for number two, we have a parking boy. And so it says, David is a parking boy at the local store. At the end of the day, his tips amounted to one, sorry, it amounted to nine $1 bills, 13 25 cent coins, and eight 10 cent coins. Calculate the amount of his tips. So in order for us to figure the total amount of tips, we're definitely going to add because they say total amount of tips. So total tips, okay? So what's gonna be his total, what's gonna be his total tips? So we have to consider each um each particular type of um money that he got. So his total tips is going to be equal to how much one dollar bills did he get? Well, if you look at the question, it says he got nine one dollar bills. Okay, so that's gonna be nine times one. All right, and then after that, he got 13, if you look at the question, he got 13, 25 cents. And so we're gonna say 13 multiplied by 0 0.25 because the way that we can write 25 cents in terms of a decimal is 0 0.25. So it's gonna be 13 multiplied by 0 0.25 because that's 13 times 0 0.25. All right, plus, and notice that he got, he got eight 10 cent coins. So it's gonna be what? That's gonna be eight multiplied by 0 0.10. So eight 10 cent coins. So that's how we write 10 cents, 0 0.10, okay? It's gonna be equal to Nine times one is what? Nine times one is definitely nine. Plus, we have 13 times 0 0.25. If we multiply 13 times 0 0.25, that's gonna be 3.25.
So it's going to be 3.25. That's $3.25. And if we have 8 times 0 0.10, well, 8 times 0 0.10, it's going to be 0 0.8. 0 0.8. So if we add all of them together, we have a 9 plus 3.25 plus 0 0.8. That's going to be what? $13.05. So that means that the amount of his tips is going to be $13.05. How do we get that? We multiply 9 times 1, which gives us 9. Then we multiply 13 times 0 0.25, which is basically 13 times 25 cents. And then after that, we multiplied um, 8 times 0 0.10, which is 8 times 10 cents. We get $9 plus $3.25 $3 plus 80 cents. And we add it all together, and our answer is $13.05. And so that's the answer for number two. Moving right along, let's go on to this particular question. And the question says that we want to complete the diagram so that those, sorry, we want to complete the diagram so that it is symmetrical about both the, the x and the y axis. So again, we're dealing with symmetry, all right? So we're trying to complete the diagram so that it's symmetrical about the x and y axis. And so I'm going to show you the completed image of this, and then I'm going to explain how we got each particular thing. So this is this is it in its completed form. As you can see, um, if you look at this image, one side is, like, is exactly identical to the other. So this right here, the y axis is the line of symmetry, because um, if we look at this side, they're both identical. This line of symmetry cuts the image in half such that one side is, ident is exactly identical to the other side. Or I should say one side is the mirror image of the other side. That's a better way to put it. Similarly, we have um, the x-axis, which is the line of symmetry. Again, it cuts the image in half such that one, one side is the mirror image of the other side. And so how are we going to get our points? Like, how are we going to get this particular shape? Well, the way that we're going to get it is if we look at this particular one and we say, okay, how much, how much is this particular point from y? Well, it's gonna be what? One, two. So since this is two spaces away, I'm going to draw um in my my point two spaces away. So it's gonna be one, two. So my first point goes here. All right. Then for for this point, this is what? One space away. So it's going to be what? One space away. Okay. So that's that. And so we connect this like this. This goes like that. And then this is this one goes like this. Okay. Now we can erase the other ones. We can erase that. And we can erase that. Okay. So that is that one for... Um, the one does that. That is that one for this side. Let's do the one above. So if we do the one above, it's gonna be one, two spaces away. So it's gonna be what? One, two spaces away. So it's gonna be the point is gonna be right here. Similarly, if we go right here, this is gonna be what? One space away. So we have the point right here. All right, and if we combine them, we have. All right, this point goes. Right here, let me erase this side. I don't need this side anymore. So what we have is we have this one going from here to here, and this one going from here to here, all right? Next up, what do we have? Well, let's look at the other one. Let me erase this. Okay, next up, what do we have? We have... Um, why does this look interesting? No, remember, all right, yeah, this is wrong. So remember, this was one space away. So that means that when we do it away 
from the, when we construct the point, it's going to be what? It's going to be one space away. So the point actually is supposed to be here. Okay. So let me erase that. So again, let me do it so we can see what, what happened. Again, it was this point, right? Again, this point is what? One space away. So when we do it on the other side, it's going to be what? One space away. So the point is right here. All right, so we connect this right here like that. Next up, we have the last side that we're going to do. And if you notice, right? If you notice, let's look at the other side. Let me use a different color. Let's say blue. So if you notice, right, this 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 point is what? One, two spaces away. So if we do the mirror image, it's going to be what? One, two spaces away. So it's going to be right here. Um, similarly, if we look at, if we look at this particular point right now, this is what? One, sorry, let's look at it again. This point, this point right now, let's look at it. This point is one space away. And so if we do a mirror image of that point, it's going to be what? one space away, so it's gonna be also here. And so let's connect the points. All right, so let's connect them. This is gonna be right there. And this is gonna be, let me erase this side. This is going to be right here. Okay, so that's how we get that. That's how we get this image. And so, if we look carefully, right? If we look carefully at it, again, this is one, two spaces away. So this is going to be what? One, two spaces away. Similarly, this is one space away. So it's going to be one space away. Also, this is what? One, two spaces away. So it's going to be what? One, two spaces away. Similarly, this is what? One, two spaces away. So it's going to be one, two spaces away. Similarly, we have one, two spaces away. So it's going to be what? One, two spaces away. And so that's how we basically draw this. That's how we complete the image so that it's symmetrical about the X and the Y axis. As we can see, the X axis is the line of symmetry for this one, two, three, four pointed star. And the Y axis is also the line of symmetry but it's four-pointed star as well. So that's how we do question number three. Move right along to question number four. All right, so this question, um, this is an order of operation question. So the idea is that you first do the parentheses. If there are no parentheses, you work on your exponents. If there are no exponents, then you work on your uh, multiplication or division, but you do them from left to right depending on which come first, from left to right, from left to right. Then we do addition and subtraction. Again, they are equally weighted, so we do them from left to right, whatever one comes first. So there's no parentheses, so we don't need to worry about the parentheses, but we do have exponents. We have three to the second power, and we also have the square root of 36. Both of these are exponents, and so, we have to work them. I'm going to first deal with, um, let's look at, let's look at three squared. Or oh, you know what, let's, um, let's deal with 30, the square root of 36 first, since that is the first one that we see from left to right. So it is gonna be equal to, what is the square root, right? What is the square root of 36? Well, the square root of 36 is equal to six. Why is that? That is because six times six is 36. So because six times six is 36, the square root of 36 is definitely six. So you write that down, plus four multiplied by five minus three squared, minus three squared. It's gonna be equal to, now we still have to do 
the exponents, right? So we have six. So we bring that down six plus four times five. minus three squared. What is three squared? Well, three squared is equal to three times three. And what is three times three? Well, three times three is equal to nine. So three times three is equal to, is equal to nine. So three squared is nine. So it's going to be nine right now. All right, so now we're done with the exponents. Now we're going to go to multiplication or division, whatever one comes first. But we only have multiplication. So the next thing we're going to do is multiplication because there's no division here. So what are we going to, what are we going to multiply? Well, we have 6 plus what is 4 times 5? 4 times 5 is definitely 20 minus 9. All right. So we already dealt with the multiplication. And we know that there's no division. So we're going to do addition and subtraction. Whatever comes first from left to right. The first one that comes is um, the addition. So we're going to add. So we have 6 plus 20. And 6 plus 20 is definitely 26 minus 9. It's going to be 26 minus 9. What is 26 minus 9? Well, 26 minus 9 is definitely 17. And so the correct answer for this one is definitely 17. Okay. All right, moving right along. Let's go on to number five. This one says write the value of 12.35 squared. Okay. And they say write the value of 12.35 squared. They want you, they want you to write it exactly. Exactly. So we have 12.35. Okay. Now we have 12.35 squared, okay? They want you to square it. Then what, do, what does that mean? All that means is that we're going to write 12.35 multiply by 12.35. And what is 12.35 times 12.35? Well, 12.35 times 12.35 it's going to be 152. That's 152 point five two two five. That's 152 point five two two five. So if you want to write 12 squared exactly, the answer is 152 point. Five two two five. All right. So the answer is one five two point five two two five. All right. Moving right along. Let's go on to question A double I. All right. So they said write the value of twelve point three five squared to two decimal places. Remember, if we write it exactly, it's one five two point five two two five. All right, that's if we were to write it exactly. But we want it to two decimal places. So since we wanted the two decimal places, this is the first decimal place. This is the second. So we're gonna go here and cut off. All right, so we want it there. Only two decimal places. Now we evaluate the number behind behind this two, which is two. Two is less than five. So since so since two is less than five, we're not gonna add one. We're just gonna leave it and we're gonna eliminate these two numbers. Because two is less than five, so we cannot round up. We just leave it as such. So it's gonna be one five two point five two. So it's one five two point five two. And so that is 12.35 squared to two decimal places. All right, moving right along, we have B, B 
B says round to three significant figures. It says round to three significant figures. So we have six, seven, eight, and three. Now, what we must know is that all non-zero digits from one to nine are significant. So that means that one is significant. That's actually the first significant number. All right. One, not one. This is six, sorry. Six is, six is significant. That's the first significant number. Or this is the first significant figure. The next significant one is going to be um, number seven. That is significant. Eight is also significant. That's the third significant figure. Remember, once it's not zero, it's significant, all right, in this number. So now there are cases where zero is significant, but non-zero digits are always significant once they are from one to nine. So um, we have the fourth significant figure, which is number three. Now we want to round to three significant figures, to three significant figures. So after the third significant figure, we're gonna cut off. So let's look at this. So this is the first significant figure, six, then seven, then eight. So the third significant figure is eight. So we gotta cut off at eight. Then we look at number three. Is three greater than five or less than five? But three is less than five. So that means that we're gonna just change this number three into zero and write our answer back. So it's gonna be six, seven, eight. We can't leave it to that. We leave, it, leave it like that. We need to put zero right here as the placeholder. So it's going to be six, seven, eight, zero. That is 6,783 rounded to three significant figures. All right. Let's move on to question BI. All right. So question BI says round to the nearest hundred. So the idea with this one is that you have six, seven, six, seven, eight, three. Okay, that's what we have. Six, seven, eight, three. Um, the number that's in the, so three is in the ones place, eight is in the tens place, but seven is in the hundreds place. So if the cutoff at seven, that's in the hundreds place, seven is in the hundreds place. And then we underline eight. Is eight greater than five or less than five? Clearly, eight is greater than five, so we're gonna add one. And so it's gonna be six, we keep the six, same six. Then we're gonna say seven plus one. Seven plus one is eight. And all of the other numbers, eight and three, we put a zero. We replace them with zero. And so that is how we round, that is how we round 6,783 to the nearest hundred. All right, let's move on. Let's move on to the next question. Okay, this one is about Jason. Well, Jason is playing a party CD. He chooses five songs, okay? The table lists the songs, the song titles and playing times. So here we have the songs and the times. So the song title, party time, going funky in, in, in the groove, wind up. And once again, we have the time, four minutes and five seconds, three minutes and 20 seconds, three minutes and 19 seconds, three minutes and three minutes and 27 seconds, and four minutes and 12 seconds. These are the playing time. So they want us to figure out the total time, the total time for the music played. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to first add up the minutes and then the seconds. All right, so let's do that. Let's do the minutes. So the minutes, if we add up the minutes, it's gonna be what? So the minutes is gonna be, if we add up the minutes, that's gonna be what? We have, we have four minutes plus three, plus three, plus three, so four plus three plus three plus three plus another four, right? 
So that's 4 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4. That's going to be equal to? Well, that's going to be equal to 17. So we have all together, we have 17 minutes. What about the seconds? We have 17 minutes. All right, what about the seconds? So let's consider the seconds. So for the seconds, we know we have what? We know we have five plus 20 plus 19 plus 27. plus 12. So let's add them all together. 5 plus 20 plus 19 plus 27 plus 12. That's going to give you 83. 83. So we have 78 minutes and 83 seconds. So that's what we have. Now, if we look at it, 78 minutes, right? And 83 seconds, we can write that in a different way, right? So let's consider it. Let's consider writing it in a different way, um, in a more compact way. So we have 17 minutes and 83 seconds. We know that that's way more seconds than we need because we know that one second, we know that um, 60 seconds is equal to um. A minute. So we're going to break, we're going to split 83 into 2 by subtracting 83 by 60. So we're going to still have 17 minutes here. So 17 minutes plus um, 60 seconds plus 23 seconds. So what did I do? What did I do there? What I did was I rewrote um, 83 as 60 seconds plus 23 seconds. All right, why would we do that? Because 60 seconds equals to, what is 60 seconds? That equals to what? That equals to one minute. So it's going to be equal to 70 minutes. 17 minutes plus, what is 60 seconds? Well, 60 seconds is going to be one minute. And so we have um, 17 minutes, one minute, and 23 seconds. So let's add all the minutes together. What do we have? 17 plus one minute is what? 17 plus 1 is 8 minutes, okay? So it's going to be 8 minutes, how much seconds? 8 minutes and 8 minutes. And 23 seconds. All right, so we have 8 minutes and 23 seconds. All right, so that's the answer for number six, eight. eight. 18 minutes, not 18, not eight, sorry, 18 minutes, because 17 plus one is 18. So it's going to be 18 minutes and 23 seconds for this one. All right, let's move on. Number, um, we're still on number six, but we're going to go on B. It says the time remaining, if the city can hold 60 minutes, The time remaining if the CD can hold 60 minutes of music. 60 minutes of music. So let's do it. Remember, that in our, all we need to do is we need to subtract or take away 18 minutes and 23 seconds from, from 60 minutes. So let's do that. So we have minutes. So we have minutes and we have what? We have seconds. So we have minutes and then we have seconds. 
All right, so how much minutes do we have? Well, we have 60 minutes. How much seconds do we have? Well, we have zero seconds because it's 60 minutes. That's all. Now we have 18 minutes. We have to subtract, right? 18 minutes and 23 seconds. All right, that's it. So let us subtract. Can we subtract 0 um, and 23? Well, we cannot take away 23 from 0. So we must, we must what? We must borrow. Okay. So let's borrow. Let's go here and regroup. So the idea here is that, if you look carefully, the idea here is that we have to borrow this. So 60 minus, 60 minus 1 is going to be what? 59. So this is 59. So now we have 59 minutes. And remember, we borrowed a whole minute. If we borrowed a whole minute, we know that 60 seconds is a minute. So it's going to be 60 plus 60 plus 00. zero. Why? Because we borrowed a whole minute and one minute is 60 seconds. Okay. Now we can do our question. Okay. Let's um, put it over on the other side right here. So now we have minutes still, still minutes. Still minutes, but now we have we still have seconds. And so how much minutes do we have now? We have 59 minutes. 59 minutes. And how much seconds do we have? 59 minutes and 60 seconds. Minus 18. 23. So it's 18 minutes and 23 seconds. All right, so 60 minus 23, well, we obviously have to borrow. This becomes 5. This is 1. So 10 minus 3 is definitely going to be 7. And 5 minus 2 is 5 minus 2 is 3. We have 30, so we have 37 minutes. 9 minus 8 is 1 and 5 minus 1 is 4. And so the answer is going to be how much minutes remaining? It's going to be 41 minutes and 23 seconds. So the time remaining is 43 minutes, 41, sorry, 41 minutes and 37 seconds. That's how much. Time is left on the track, or on the CD, rather. So 41 minutes and 37 seconds. Seconds. Let's spell seconds, right? All right. Awesome, awesome stuff. Very good. So the answer that we got, right? The answer that we got was 41 minutes and 37 seconds. That's the answer that we got. All right, moving on to question number, moving on to question number, number seven. So let's go to question number seven. All right, question number seven says the following. It says, Mr. Adderley and Mr. Bean are business partners. They share profits in the ratio seven to nine. This year, the total profits were 49,600. Calculate Mr. Bean's share. Calculate Mr. Bean's share. All right, let's read it again. Mr. Adderley and Mr. Bean are business partners. They show profits in the ratio seven to nine. This year, the total profits were 49,600. Calculate Mr. Bean's share. So <clears throat> the idea here is that we're taking 49,000, 
So imagine you have $49,600 and we're going to take that and we're going to split it into 16 equal parts. So again, we're going to take 49,600 and split it into 16 equal parts. We're going to give seven out of that 16 to Mr. Adderley and we're going to get given nine of those equal parts of the 16 to Mr. Bean. So the idea here is that once we can figure out what is one equal part, then all we got to do is multiply it by seven to give Mr. Adderley his seven and then multiply it by nine to give Mr. Bean his nine. But we have to find what is one equal part because one equal part, it's going to be that one equal part from the 49,600. Once we get that one equal part, again, we multiply it by seven to get Mr. Adley's share and multiply it by nine to get Mr. Bean's share. That's, so that's going to be our order of business. We're going to first try to figure out what is one equal part. Okay, so let's do that. One equal part. So one equal part. One equal part. Is going to be um, 49,600. So one equal part. One equal part is going to be 49,600. And we're going to divide that by 16. And 16 is simply the sum of 9 and 7. So 49,600 divided by the sum of seven and nine. So seven plus nine is going to be definitely 16. So seven plus nine is 16. It's gonna be equal to 49,600. divided by seven plus nine, which is 16. It's so gonna be equal to, if we take 49,000 and we divide it, sorry, if we take 49,600 and we divide it by 16, the result or the quotient is going to be 3,100. So that's one equal part. So now that we have one equal part, we're going to take that one equal part and we got to multiply it by nine because we know that Mr. Bean got nine and Mr. Adderley got seven. So we're trying to find Mr. Bean share. So we know Mr. Bean is going to be equal to nine equal parts. So Mr. Bean, Mr. Bean's share. That's what we're trying to figure out. Mr. Bean's share. And again, we know Mr. Bean is equal to nine equal parts. So in order for us to get this, in order for us to get Mr. Bean's share, we're going to say nine multiplied by three thousand one hundred. So nine multiplied by three thousand one hundred. That's going to be equal to nine times 3,100, and the answer is 27,900. Again, 27,900. So that means that Mr. Bean got 27,900 out of the 49,600, which is nine equal parts. Again, that's nine times 3,100, which is 27,000. 900. So that's part A. Let's move on to part B. The idea for all of these questions is that we want to first find what is one equal part. So that's the general rule when we think about these type of questions. So let's look at this one. It says last year, Mr. Adderley received 4,500 as his share. Now we want to calculate with this information, calculate the total profits for last year. So again, like I said, with these questions, the trick is, is first finding what is um, one equal part. That's, two, that's typically the trick. Figure out what is one equal part. And once you figure out what is one equal part, then you can operate from there. Okay. So 
we have one equal part. So the one equal part is not going to be the same um, for 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 this b. It's a different equal part because it's a different if it's it's a different one equal part because they change some important details for us. So again, so we got to find over this one equal part again. So how are we going to figure out what is one equal part? Well, they told us that uh, Mr. Adderley, well, he got 4,550. That's what Mr. Adderley got. But we know that Mr. Adderley, whatever Mr. Adderley got, is whatever Mr. Adderley gets is going to be equal to seven equal parts. So whatever Mr. Adderley get, whatever that is, it's going to be 7 out of the 16. And so that means that since we know that Mr. Adderley got um, 4,550, we know that that is 7 equal parts. So if we know that 7 equal parts is 4,550, that means that 1 equal part is going to be 4,550 divided by, divided by 7. Okay, if we want to figure out what is 1 equal part. So seven equal parts is 4,550, but one equal part is going to be uh, 4,550 4, divided by seven. And the answer is definitely 650. So that means that one equal part is 650. Now we want to figure what is the total profits. What is the total profits, the total profits, okay? Now the total profits is going to be how much um, they get in all. Like how much is the total, all right? How much is going to be what they made as an overall sum? Okay, so the total profits is, and so that means that we already know what one equal part is. So in order to find the total profits, we're going to take that one equal part and multiply it by 16 because we know that all together they have 16 equal parts. So that means that in order for us to figure what is the total profits that were made, we're going to take one equal part, which is 650, and multiply it by um, 16. And we, we're using 16 because that's the sum of their equal parts, the 7 and the 9. Okay? So what is 7 plus 9? The 7 plus 9 is definitely 16. So it's going to be equal to 650 multiplied by 650 multiplied by 16. And that's going to be equal to what? 650 multiplied by 16 is going to be 10,400. Again, 650 multiplied by 16 is 10,400. All right? And so that's how we get the total profit. So. Um, Mr. Adderley is going to get 4550 out of the 10400 all right? So let's move on to the next question. This is question number eight. Question number eight. And it's an algebra question, but it's an algebra word problem question. And so for this one, we have, it says that um, to watch, as what involves tickets and ticket watching. It says to watch the summer sports competition, a student ticket costs T dollars, and that's actually a T, right? And some students might be confused. Mr. Petit, why T? What is T? T? Isn't that supposed to be a letter? It's supposed to be like $5, $10, right? So T is a variable which represents a specific amount. They do not tell us the, the specific amount. So we just have to use a variable to represent a specific amount. So to watch the summer sports competition, a ticket, a student ticket costs T dollars. That's how much the student ticket costs. A certain amount that we don't know, so we just call it T. An adult ticket costs what? Five dollars more than the student ticket. So we know that the student ticket costs T dollars, but an adult ticket costs what? Five dollars more. All right. And so if we want to figure out the cost of the adult ticket, we're going to do the student ticket plus $5. What's the student ticket? That's going to be what? T. That's for the student ticket. And what is the adult ticket? Well, the adult ticket is going to be $5 more. And so that means that the cost of the adult ticket is going to be T plus 5. T plus 5. So that's the correct answer for this one. T plus 5. The amount of the student plus 
five dollars more. Moving right along, let's move on to question number eight B. Question number eight B. Now for question number eight B, what we have here is they said, okay, all right, since you know what's the cost of a, an adult ticket, we want you to figure out um the total cost of some tickets. We want to figure out the total cost in simplest form, so be able to simplify it for a family of what? Two adults and three students. Okay, so you have to figure out the cost of tickets for two adults, right? Two adults and three students. So let's let's first deal with the adults. So the adults is gonna be how much for the adult ticket? We already found it from the beginning. That's T plus five. So the adult ticket is gonna be T plus five. Now remember how much adults do we have? Well we have we have actually two adults. It's gonna be T plus five plus T plus five. Okay, so that's gonna be the cost of the two adult tickets. But now we need three student tickets. So since we need three student tickets, that's um we know that a student ticket costs what? T dollars. It's only T dollars. Not T not T plus five. So it's gonna be three three student tickets. So it's gonna be this is one student ticket, that's T. And then we have another student ticket that is another T. And then we have another student ticket that we have to add again. So that's going to be three T, three student tickets. Now, they want us They want us to do what? They want us to simplify everything, all right? So that means that we're going to take all of our T's and bring them together. All of the T's that we have, this T, the next T. Do not confuse the T's with the plus now. This T, the next T, all of the T's we're gonna combine together. All right, and so let's bring them here. Okay, all of the T's come together. So we can combine them. So all of the T's come together. So, so far we have T plus T plus T plus T plus T. So there's gonna be Let's change the letter, I mean the color, sorry. So it's gonna be what? T is gonna be equal to, how much T's we have? T, one, two, three, four, five. So it's gonna be five T's, so it's what? T plus T plus, that's two T's, plus T, that's three T's, plus T plus T. So we have five T's, and then we have, and then we gotta take the numbers and we gotta put them separately. So it's gonna be um, five and five right now. So let's take the numbers and carry it over this side. So it's gonna be plus five plus five. Again, it's gonna be plus five plus five. Now we already know what is um five plus five. Five plus five is definitely ten. But let's deal with the T's first. How much T's do we have? One, two, three, four, five T's. So we have five T's, so this is five T. And how much fives do we have? We have two fives, and we know that five plus five is definitely going to be ten. So it's gonna be five T plus 10. That is the answer for number eight, five T plus 10. Number eight, question B. All right, moving right along. Let's move on to the next question, question number nine A. All right, it says express, express 0 0.475 as a percentage. So we have 0 0.475. Again, we have 0 0.475. And we want to express that as a percentage. Now, how are we going to express this decimal as a percentage? But in order to do that, we must multiply it by 100. Okay. And 0 0.475 multiplied by 100. Well, that equals to 0 0.475 
multiplied by, by 100, that's going to be equal to 47.5. Now you can easily just use a calculator to multiply it. Use a calculator, and if you multiply carefully, you would have 47.5. And so the answer here is going to be 47.5%. Okay? 47.5%. So that's the answer for number nine, A, I, 47.5%. And so 0 0.75, 0 0.475, written as a percentage, is 47.5%. Let's move on to the next question. It says, okay, express the decimal number 0 0.475 as a fraction in those terms. And so the idea here is that notice how much um, notice how much numbers we have behind a decimal point. We have one, two, three. So there are three numbers behind the decimal point. Because there are three numbers behind the decimal point, then that means that I'm going to write one, two, three zeros. If there were two numbers behind the decimal point, I just would write two zeros. If there are one number behind the decimal point, I just would write one zero. So because there are three numbers behind the decimal point, I write three zeros and I add the one. You always add the one. So it's going to be a thousand. But if it was two numbers behind the decimal point, it would be 100. If it was one number behind the decimal point, it would have been 10. Okay, so you have to look at how much numbers you have behind the decimal point. So it's going to be a thousand. And let me make this line a little bit more straighter than that. So that so one thousand is going to be your denominator. The numerator is going to be this number right out four seven five. So I say numerator four seven five. All right. So awesome. Now we have defined a number that goes into both four seven five and a thousand. The number that we can use that does it the quickest is definitely 25 up. Now you could use five, five will work, but five won't reduce it all the way. You have to use five again. If you use five, well, you have to do it. Um, you can't just do it once, you have to do it more than once. So what is 45 divided by 25? Well, if you look at your calculator, 45 divided by 25 is definitely 19. And we're gonna put the fraction bar. 1000 divided by 25 is 40. So it's going to be 40. So the answer here is going to be 19 over 40. Nineteen over 40. All right, so a double i is 19 over 40. All right, so that's how we that's how we express um zero point four seven five as a decimal. Sorry, that's how we express zero point four seven five as a fraction in those terms. And it's a fraction in those terms, and you know you're right because um there's no number besides one that could go into nineteen and forty without leaving a remainder. Okay, so let's go on to to the next part, part B. Okay. But B says that an arts and craft project requires what? 42 pieces of wire, each of length one and four over seven feet. Assuming that there is no waste in cutting, calculate the minimum length of wire that should be purchased. All right, so basically the idea is that you have, the project needs 42 wires, okay, 42 wires. Each of them has to be a length of one and four over seven feet. So you have to basically get 42 of them. And all of them have to be of that particular size. So how how long should the wire be, right? That uh, is going to be able to, when you cut it, give you 42 pieces of wire. So the idea is that you have to basically take one, one and four over seven and multiply it um, by 42. So we have one and four over seven multiplied by the whole number 42. Now, again, we can express our whole number, any whole number as a fraction. 
just by putting 42 over 1. And that goes to any frac any whole number. You can always express the whole number as a fraction just by putting it over 1. So now the idea here is that, okay, we need to change this mixed number into an improper fraction. So let's do that. Um, let's do that. 1 times 7. So we do that by multiplying 1 and 7. 1 times 7 is 7, and we're going to add the 4. So we multiply the whole number and the denominator, and we add the numerator. So 1 times 7 is 7. 7 plus 4, that's going to be 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So it's going to be 11. And again, we keep the denominator. So the denominator is 7. So let's do that again. 1 times 7 is 7, plus 4 is 11. But we keep the denominator the same. Now we multiply um, 42 over 1. 42 over 1. All right, let's multiply. What is 11 times 42? 11 times 42 is 462. That's 462. Divided by, divided by 7. So we have 462 divided by 7. It's going to be equal to 66. So 462 divided by, this bar means divided by. So 462 divided by 7. How do we get that? We multiply the 11 by the 42. We multiply the 7 by the 1 to get 7. So we have 11. So we have, so we have 462 divided by 7, and that's going to be 66. So in order for you to um, have a length of wire, the length of wire, the minimum length of wire that should be purchased so that you can have 42 pieces of wire of length 1 and 4 over feet. 4 over 7 feet is going to be 66 feet. All right, that's how long the wire should be. Um, assuming that there's no weight, uh, assuming that there's no waste. All right, let's move on to question number that was number nine. Let's go on to question number 10. Move right along. We have this question um, here. We have a list of numbers. Inside our set, we have 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28. All right. So we have whole numbers starting from 20 and ending at 28. And it says, okay, from the set of numbers written above, from the set of numbers above, write down a multiple of 13. And so we know that basically we have to look at the multiplication tables of 13. So what are the multiples of 13? Well, 13 times one is 13, but 13 times two is what? Go in the calculator and do 13 times 2. Well, 13 times 2 is definitely 26. Okay. So, therefore, a multiple of 13 from this list is 26. So, the answer here is definitely 26. Again, all you need to do is go in the calculator and multiply 13 times 2, and your answer is, 13, and your answer is 26. And so, 26 is the only multiple of 13 from this list or in this set. Let's move right along. Let's go to question B. We still have the same set. From the set of numbers, write down a factor. Or write down the factor of 81. Well, if we look at it carefully, we want, uh, we want the factor of 81. Um, so 81, 81 divided by 27. What is 81 divided by 7? So do that in the calculator. 81 divided by 7. If the answer is a whole number, then that means that 27 is a factor of 81. And that's absolutely true. Because 81 divided by 27 is 3. So that means that 3 times 27 is 81, which means that 27 is a factor of 81. So the answer here is 27. All right, moving right along. We have question 
Moving right along, we have question B. Sorry, question C. Um, they say from the set of numbers, write down the prime number. Prime number is a number that only has two factors, one in itself. And the only prime number here is going to be 23 because 23 only has two factors, one in itself. The only two numbers that can go into 23 without leaving a remainder is 23 and one. So that makes 23 a prime number. The rest are composite numbers. All right, move right along. Let's go into D. D says that we want the lowest common multiple of four and 14. So let's list the multiples of four. Well, we have four, then we have eight, then after eight is 16. All right, no, four, eight, 12, my apologies. Four, eight, 12, then 16, then 20, and 24. And after 24, four times seven is 28. Four times eight is 32. Four times nine is 36 and so on. And so let's continue. We have um, the multiples of 14. What are the multiples of 14? Well, we have Four times 14 times one, which is 14. 14 times two, which is 28. 14 times three, which is 42. 14 times four, which is 56. All right, so, okay, moving right along, we have, um, with the figure, what is the lowest common multiple of these? So it's gonna be, um, it's definitely going to be 28. Okay. So 28. So we have 28 is common in both of these and it's the lowest common multiple. And so if we look at our numbers, the number that is the lowest common multiple of 4 and 14 is going to be 28. So the answer is 28. All right, awesome. Moving right along. Let's go on to E, the last part of, of number 10. E. It says, from the set of numbers, write down the highest common factor of 63 and 84. So what we need to do here is we need to list the factors of both the numbers. We're going to start off with the factors of 63. So what are the factors of, of 63? Basically, what numbers can go into 63 without leaving a remainder? Okay, so factors of 63. Again, which numbers can go into 63 without leaving a remainder? So we have one. What else? Three. Seven. And then nine. And then 21. And then 63. Um, then we have factors because 1 times 63 is 63, 3 times 21 is 63, and 7 times 9 is 63. Let's move on to the other factors, uh, or the factors of a different number. Let's look at factors of 84. Factors of 84. So you want the factors of 84. So we always start off with one. One is definitely a factor of 84. So we have one. It's a prime number, so definitely two is gonna be there. Two, then we have three, then we have four, then we have six. we have seven, and we have 12, then we have 14, 
Then we have 21. Then we have 28. And then we have um, 42. And then we have 84. So all of these are the factors of 84. And on top, we have the factors of 63. Which number is the highest common factor of both 63 and 84? So the answer is 21. So the highest common factor is definitely going to be 21. Okay, so the multiple of 13 is 26, factor of 81, 27, prime number, 23. Those common multiple of 4 and 14, 28, and highest common factor is 21. Okay, let's move on to the next question. All right, this is number 11A. 11A. Okay, this one says, given that we know that A is 7, so that's what the question say. The question says, listen, A is 7. That's what A is. A equals 7 and B is 0. So given that we know that, calculate the value of A squared minus 4B. So basically, we are given some values, right? 7 and 0, and they basically want us to substitute it into our expression. So the idea here is that we have um, a squared minus 4b. Remember, wherever we see a, we put 7. If we see b, we put 0. So instead of putting a, we're going to put what? 7 squared. So it was 7 raised to the power of 2. All right, so 7 squared. Wherever we see b, we put 0. So 4 times 0. And so good. So now we have, it's going to be equal to um, 7 squared. What is 7 squared? 7 squared is definitely what? 49. And 4 times 0. What is 4 times 0? 4 times 0 is definitely 0. This is going to be equal to 49 minus 0, which is definitely 49. And so that means that a squared minus 4b when a is 7 and b is 0 is actually equal to 49. All right, so that's how we get that. Let's move on to question 11b. Now, question 11b is what we call a linear equation. We have to solve this linear equation for the value of x. This is going to be 5, open bracket, x minus 2 equals to 3. Okay, so the idea here is that we want to isolate x. We want x to be on one side and everything else on the other side. That's the goal. But right now, x is in parentheses. So we have to take that x out, and we do that by distributing 5. So 5 times x, that's the operation here. 5 times x is definitely 5x. And 5 times 2 is going to be 10, okay? And so we have 5x minus 10. It's going to be equal to 3. The next thing we're going to do, we're going to send the negative 10 over the equal sign, which will make it a positive 10. So it's going to be 3 plus 10. All right, 3 plus 10. And so we have 5x equals to 3 plus 10. And this is equal to, what is 3 plus 10? But 3 plus 10 is definitely 13. And we have 5x equals to 13. Again, the idea is that we want to get rid of anything that's on the side of x, because we want x to be on one side and everything else to be on the other side. So we're going to divide both sides by 5. Again, we're going to divide both sides by 5. 
So these two cancels. So that means that x is going to be equal to 13 divided by 5. What is 13 divided by 5? 13 divided by 5 is definitely 2.6. And so the answer is 2.6. So x equals to 2.6. So x equals to 2.6. All right, and that's how you get your three points. x equals to 2.6. Okay, moving right along. Let's go on to question number 12. Now, the interesting thing about question number 12 is that question number 12 is a geometry question. So we can need a protractor, we need a compass, we need a pencil, and ruler to complete this question accurately. Okay, so the question says, um, use a protractor. So I using a protractor, measure and write down the size of angle B. This symbol right here means angle. This is angle B. So we have to go here and measure this size, the size of angle B right out. And so we have to use our protractor to do that, to measure the size of angle B. So let's do that. So we got to get the protractor and measure the size of angle B. Okay, so let's go here. Here we have the image recreated. And so we want to go here and measure the size of angle B. This is a course of a tractor. Notice that my vertex, sorry, notice that the center of my protractor is at the vertex of angle B. And that's directly in the middle. Also notice that my line the line of my protractor is directly in sync with the leg of my angle B. And so let's measure. So if we look carefully, right, this is 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. Let's zoom in some more. So we had 60. This is 65. It's going to be 66. 67, and this is what? 68. 68. So that means that the size of angle B is going to be 68 degrees. Okay, so let's put that in. So angle B is going to be equal to 68 degrees. All right, good. The next thing that they said is, so after ready draw, after ready, um, measure using protractor. The next thing they say is they want us to um leaving all construction lines, use pencil, pull and comp and a pair of compasses to bisect to bisect angle B. So they want us to bisect angle B. To bisect something basically means to cut it in half. And we have to use a ruler, pencil, protractor, sorry, ruler, pencil, and a a pair of compasses in order to do this. Okay. So let's do this. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, bisect angle B. So we already know that angle B is 68 degrees. So if we cut it on, if, so if we cut it in half, each side is supposed to be 35, sorry, 34 degrees, which is 68 divided by 2. So let's move this protractor. We need a compass. So let's take our compass point, and we're going to take the sticky part, and place it at B. And we are going to take this compass and extend it a, sh a short distance, not a very long distance, a short distance, and then we're going to lock it. Okay, make sure the compass, this is very important, make sure the compass size stays the same. And so now we're going to draw an arc, like so. All right. We're drawing an arc. Okay, let's draw this arc properly. Okay, let's do it. So drawing this arc, very good. All right, good. So this is our, our arc, all right? So this is our arc. So we took our compass and we draw an arc at B. The next thing, so we put the sticky point here and then we draw an arc like so. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go 
back to our compass and place it right where the first arc and my line segment intersects. Notice I did not change the compass size, so do not change the compass size. So we put it here, and then we're going to draw an arc like so. Okay, draw this arc. All right, that should be good enough. Then we're going to go up to here where my next arc intersects the next leg of my triangle. Sorry, the next leg of my... So we're going to go to where the arc intersects the other leg of my angle, which is right there. And so we're going to go right there. And so we draw an arc. Like so. Excellent. All right, so now that we're done with that, we're going to use our ruler. Well, we should use our ruler. I want you to use your ruler. I want you to use a ruler. I want you to draw a line that goes directly through that that goes directly through. Um, draw a line. Sorry. Draw a line that goes directly through B and this um the point where the two arcs meet. So you're gonna draw a line that starts at B and and continues up until we have the point of intersection. So please use a a ruler to draw that line. I'm going to use this. Um, I'm going to use this to draw draw my line, but you must use a ruler. And so extend it out like so. And we want it like that. Make sure it's directly in the middle. All right, there we go. All right, so move right along. We have to go after ready bisect it. Let's measure it and see if we are see if we are accurate. Um, if we look carefully, um, this is sixty eight degrees. If we bisect it, each part is supposed to be thirty four because it's sixty eight divided by sixty eight divided by two. So if we look at it, this is zero, ten, twenty, thirty. This is 35, this is 34, that's perfect, okay? So look carefully. This side is supposed to be 34, the other side is supposed to be 34, and if you add 34 and 34, you get 68, all right? So we bisected it perfectly. One side and uh, the other side must, have this, must be the same measure, and this side is 34, and this side is also 34. So that's, it's bisected properly. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to move this now we're gonna, now it's time to bisect the line. So if we look carefully at the question, the question said, okay, after you already bisected the angle at B, which we already did, I want you to bisect a line AB. So here's the line AB and they want us to bisect it, which means to cut it in half equally, all right? So let's go back to our image and we need to get our, get our compass and, and um, and bisect. So in order to bisect, you're going to go take your tippy point of B and extend it to about 60-75% of the line. All right, this should be an excellent place. I just hope that I have enough space up and down. So now we're going to draw a line, uh, draw an arc rather. Remember, your, the sticky point is at um, B and your pencil is about 75% of your line. So let's Draw an arc, like so, and we're going to draw it down below. Okay, I don't have to be that long, so let me uh, move that. So I think I can shorten this some more. All right, so maybe like so, right there, so that everything fits inside of the, the frame that, we, that we're dealing with. Let's draw an arc. Okay, much better. And draw an arc. Excellent. So we draw in the arc at B. Now we're going to keep the compass size the same. We're going to go to A and draw an arc. All right, so let's draw an arc here. Let's cut it. Excellent. This is great. All right, very good. 
So the next thing that we're going to do is that we're going to draw a line. We're going to draw a line from here all the way down there, cutting or bisecting the line. So you take your ruler, right? And you're going to draw a straight line. And you're going to draw a straight line that cuts the, that bisects the line. So you're going to draw a straight line all the way down, like so, okay? So let's let's do that line. So we have um, this one right there. So let's go. Okay. Um, it's in, is it in the middle? Uh, we want to make sure it's in the middle exactly. Um, okay, extend some more. No, that's not really in the middle. Let's do it again. So we have. All the way down, come down here. All right, that's much better. So here we have this line bisecting, cutting this point, and also cutting this point, and so it is bisected. We can always check. So let's use our ruler and see if e either side are equal, all right? So let's use our ruler, see how, how long our line is, and then see if each side are equal to each other. All right, so let's do it. If we look at the measure of our line, we'd say that our line measures a whole lot. So this is So this is zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Our line measures about 8.2, right? And if you do 8.2 divided by two, so when we cut it in half, 8.2 divided by two, that's gonna be 4.1. And this is 4.1 exactly. And so we have bisected our line in an excellent way. So that's it. So let's move this. So this is the final product. Let me take the final product and put it on the PowerPoint slide. So we have the final product here. But this is how it should look when you do it. All right, let's move right along. This is going to be, where's the PowerPoint? Okay, there we go. All right. Awesome. Now let's move on to question number well we question number 13. So question number 13 a it says complete the following conversions and so we have um 2.47 liters equals to blank miller liters so the acronym that we could use here is that is helpful is knock him down and since we have L, which we're dealing with leaders, we're going to say knock him down, Larry. Okay. Don't commit murder. And so each one of these letters represents something that's important. But we're only focusing on leaders and milliliters. So let's label leaders. We only focus on, we only write the ones that you're focusing on. Leaders. Right? and milliliters. Liters and milliliters. All right, so we have 2.47 liters is equal to blank milliliters. So the idea is that we're moving from liters to milliliters. So let's move how much. So again, we're moving from liters to milliliters. So let's move. This is going to be what? One, two, three. Okay. So look at that carefully. We have, we move three times to the right. So since we have 2.47, we're going to move also three times to the right. So it's going to be one, two, and three, 
That's where the decimal point is going to be, right here. So the answer is definitely two, four, seven, zero. We move three times over to the right, and we do the same thing with our number. Next, let's go ahead and look at question 13. Excuse me, let's look at thir question 13, a double I. So we have thir 328 centimeters equals to blank meters. So, so again, this is going to be knock him down. Now, remember, we're dealing with centimeters and meters. It's going to be knock him down. Minister, don't commit murder. Don't commit murder. All right, so we have 328 dollars. Sorry, 328 centimeters equals to blank meters. So we're going to move from what? Centimeters to what? Meters. So this is centimeters right there, and then this is meters. So it's going to be going to move over how much times? One, two. So we're going to move over two times to the left. So we have three, two, eight. Notice that our decimal point is here. Let's move it twice to the, to the left. So we move twice to the left. Not twice to the right, twice to the left. This is going to be one, two. So we're going to move over twice to the left. So it's going to be one and two. So this is where our decimal point is going to be. So now we have three. The answer is going to be 3.28. 3.28. So, so 328 centimeters is actually 3.28 meters. Moving right along. Let's go on to question A, triple I. 13A triple I. So we have, um, here we have grams, right? Grams. Grams to kilograms. So um, this is going to be knock him down. Instead of saying, remember it's G, so knock him down. Grammy, don't commit murder. And so we're moving from grams to kilograms. Um, if we're moving from grams to kilograms, how do we move again from grams to kilograms? So that's going to be one, two, and three. So again, we're moving from grams to kilograms. So it's going to be three times to the left. Again, one, two, three. So it's going to be 500. And again, three times to the left. So it's going to be one, two, and three. So decimal point goes here. And so what we have is we have to put a placeholder. <clears throat> we have to put a placeholder in front of this, this, the decimal point. So it's going to be 0 0.5. Okay, so it's going to be equal to 0. Point five. Now we have uh, the two zeros in the back, but we don't have to write that down because um, it's irrelevant because 0 0.5 is the same thing as 0 0.5, 0, 0, Again, we don't have to write the two zeros in the back because they're ir irrelevant because 0 0.5 is the same thing as 0 0.500. 0, 0. So the answer here is just going to be 0 0.5. Okay, so 500 grams is equal to 0 0.5 kilograms. All right, moving right along. Let's go on to question number, oh, I'm still on 13, 13 A, 13 B now, 13 B. So let's look at 13 B. So 13 B says, okay, Judy measures her height to be five feet, five inches. Okay, so five feet, five inches. She measures her height to be 5 feet 5 inches. Taking 1 inch to be equal to 2.54, convert her height to centimeters.
again, at the summer sports competition, a contingent of 37 competitors came from the Family Islands. Of these, 21 completed in track events. That's T. 19 completed in field events. Uh, that's F. And nine completed competed in both track and field events. Use the diagram. Use the above data rather to complete the Venn diagram below. Okay, so basically we have this Venn diagram and we have some information and we have to use this information to complete this Venn diagram. This is actually four points. So let's use this information in the diagram carefully. So Repeated in both track and field, what we're going to do is we're going to put nine in the middle because that's the intersection. Okay, nine completed in both track and field. The next thing they say is that, hey, 21 competed in what track events? So we have 21 that competed in track events. So this whole circle must add up to 21. We already have nine here, so we need to figure out what the rest is to get 21. So it's going to be 21 minus 9, okay, because that's the intersection. And 21 minus 9 is definitely 12. And so the number of people who are going to be in track only is just going to be 12. But 12 plus 9 is 21. That's how we get the, the sum for track. All of them together, 12 plus 9 must be 21. Next, we have... Um, next we have this side and so the idea here is that they tell us in the in the past in the information that 19 19 people competed in field events so there are 19 people that completed in field events so that means that the whole thing this whole field events thing should be 19, the whole thing, okay? You already know that one part of it is nine. So what's the rest gonna be such that we can get 19 overall? So we're gonna say 19 minus nine. And what is 19 minus nine? That's gonna be 10, okay? So 19 minus nine is 10. So that means that we have um, inside here 10, okay? So it's going to be 10. All right, so the Venn diagram so far, we have 12, 9, and 10. But if we add 12, 9, and 10, that's only 31. We have 37 competitors. So we need to figure out the number of students who played neither sports, neither track and field, Sorry, neither um, track or field. So we're going to take 37, okay? We're going to take 37. We're going to minus that with 12. Plus 9. Plus 10. All right, so it's going to be equal to 37 minus, what is 12 plus 9 plus 10? Well, 12 plus 9 plus 10 is definitely 31. And what is 31 minus, 30, what is 37 minus 31? Well, 37 minus 31 is definitely 6. And so on the outside, we're going to have 6. So 12, 9, 10. Sorry, 12, 9, 10 is what's going to be on the inside. And 6 is what's going to be on the outside. Okay? Moving right along, we have um, 
this question it says hey using information in your venn diagram write down the number of competitors that does track and field only so they want us to do track and field only so that means that we're only going to look at the ones that does track and field only not the ones that is a part of the intersection so track and field only is going to be what what number 12 very good 12 12 the track and field is on sorry the track sorry not the track and field because it's just track track only is just going to be 12 and so the correct answer here is definitely 12. Um, next up, we have um, the field events. So the field is going to be um, not field, sorry. They ask us, um, using information in, in your Venn diagram, write down the number of com competitors in sports other than track and field. So we want to figure out who does sports but does not do track and field. Um, so what uh what is the answer so it must not be track and field so it's going to be everyone on the outside of track and field which is if we look at the diagram it's going to be six those students who did not like um track and field those, those students who are not a part of track and field is six right so the answer is definitely going to be six all right so we're going to put six here That's um uh, the number of persons who pay, who um uh who are in sports other than track and field. All right, let's move on to the next question. All right, let's move on to the next question. This is gonna be question 15. Okay. Let's move on. Let's go. All right, so for number 15, we have from the diagram, calculate the size of angle A. Again, from the diagram, calculate the size of angle A. Again, that's the question for number 15. Calculate the size of angle A. All right, so let's continue with this question. It says, they want us to, from the diagram, they want us to figure out the angle A. So they want us to calculate the size of angle A. Um, Notice that we have angle A here. And the idea is that, um, angle A and 108, they are on a straight line, all right, and they are at a common point. And so angles on a straight angles on a straight line at a common point, the rule says that they add up to 180 degrees. So 108 and, and A add up to 180 degrees. And so that means if you want to figure what angle A is, we have to subtract um, 108 from 180. And we are able to get the size of angle A. So it's going to be 180 minus 108. And 180 minus 108 is definitely going to be 72. So the answer for A is 72. Again, we subtract 180 and 108 to get 72. All right, moving right along, we have... Question number 15, B. We're going to start off with BI, all right? So BI, for BI, we're going to figure out the value of X, okay? We're going to figure out the value of X. And if you look carefully, we see that, um, we see that there is a Z shape. And so um, let's draw it in. So if we look carefully, we see the Z. So this is... The Z here. All right, this is the C. All right, and so what that means is that this angle right here and this angle right here are equal because alternate interior angles are equal. So if this is 30 degrees, then X is also 30 degrees. So the answer for this one is 30 degrees. All right, so let's move right move along. Let's go on to um, question um, B double I. So here they want us to figure out um, the size angle Z. 
angle Z is right here. So if we look at, no, angle Z is for B. No, this is B triple I. So where is B double I? Okay, I do not have B double I here, but B double I, let's do B double I, because B double I is a part of it. So B double I, they have, Um, let's write that down. Let's use a pen. So for B double I, let me do it here. B double I. They want us to figure out the size of angle Y. Okay. So B double I, you want to figure out the size of angle Y. So we need to figure out the size of angle Y here. We know that we have angle Y right here. But an important thing to notice is that if we look carefully, um, this is a backward, this is a C. This is a C shape. Watch the shape. Okay, so right here. That's a C shape. Okay. So what that means is that means that this angle right here, angle Y, and also 120 degrees, that means that they are supplementary angles, which means that they add up to 180 degrees. So the co-interior angle rule says that angles that are co-interior with each, that are, the co-interior angle rule says that co-interior angles are, they add up to 180 degrees. And so that means that, what that means is that if we have Y, all right, and we have um, 120, in order to figure out what is Y, we gotta subtract 120 and 180. So it's going to be 180 degrees minus 180 degrees minus 120. The reason why we use 120 is because, like I said, 120 and Y must add up to 180 degrees. So Y is equal to 180 degrees minus 120. And so Y is going to be equal to 60 degrees. So Y is 60 degrees. All right, move right along. Let's go on to B, I, 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 B, triple I. So calculate the size of angle B, uh, sorry, calculate the size of angle C. Let's get the figure what, what angle C is. All right. So again, we have the figure with the size of angle B. All right, so let's look at it. Trying to figure out the size of angle C. We know we see this there and we see also this here. This means that they are vertically opposite to each other. And vertically opposite angles are equal. So that means that Z is equal to 120. So Z is equal to 120 degrees. I can see it's one hundred is one hundred and twenty. Why? Because Z and one twenty are radically opposite. All right, let's move on to question. Let's move on to the next question. Question number question number seventeen, I think. So let's move on to the next question. The previous one was um 15 so this is gonna gotta be number 17 i mean 16 sorry all right regardless of what it is let's move on and do it all right so we have um 